and welcome to the weekly message for The Table. The Table is a church in Davenport, Iowa, where people are moving from greed toward generosity, from violence toward peacemaking, from isolation toward neighborliness, and from fear toward faith. I'm Pastor Rob Leverage, and it's good to be with you on this beautiful day. I've got a, a nice uh, little announcement uh, to share that The Table, for the first time ever, <laughs> we are going to be having worship gatherings on Sunday morning. It's a, it's a radical concept, I know, but for our entire life as a, as a church, we've met on Sunday evenings and we just deci- decided to try something new. So we're going to be gathering um, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. And our location, which is still a pretty new location for us, is the, the church house uh, where we now have our center of our, of our ministry life. It's 1435 West 14th Street in Davenport, Iowa. But if you are one of uh, many people who just joins us for messages online and you can't get to a, uh, be near us in person, that is totally fine. We'll continue posting YouTube videos and podcasts and uh, just enjoy the community we're able to have no matter where people live. So our, our scripture today comes from the Gospel of John chapter 10, and it is... Uh, a word about Jesus. Uh, Jesus is describing himself as the good shepherd. Let's open our hearts, open our ears, and give a good listen. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So there is a famous uh, quote from the iconic trumpeter uh, Louis Armstrong that if you have to ask what jazz is, you'll never know. (laughs) Jazz is an art form that resists definition and it resists explanation. You're not going to understand jazz from, you know, reading a book about it (laughs) or having somebody tell you about it. You just have to experience jazz in order to know something about jazz. What is it like to be underwater? I mean, you could take your best shot at explaining it, right? But the real way to know what it's like to be underwater is to experience it for yourself. Uh, The other, uh, a few weeks ago, my wife and I went to the Netherlands on vacation. And the, the Netherlands is a wonderful country. It's just a, a lovely, it, it was just a delightful place for us to visit. And I have tried to describe what it is like uh, to, to people that I've talked to about it since we've gotten back. But, you know, the more I talk about it, the more you, words I employ, the more I actually feel like I'm not really capturing what the country is like. There's all these small things that sort of add up and some of them are intangible some of them are it's really hard to put your finger on it but it makes it feel like its own kind of place right and the experience of being there really is bigger and deeper than any explanation you could give of the place Um, it's mother's day and you know i always think about moms on mother's day but I, i also think a lot about children on mother's day And especially I think about babies, um, because before language develops for a baby, they don't have the words uh, to even try to describe and explain the things that they are going through or the things that they're thinking about. You know, adults will say that certain things are difficult to put into words, right? That's how we say it. We, we, I, I just can't put it into words. Well, babies can't put anything into words, right? They don't operate that way at all yet, <laughs> you know. For, for newborns in particular, for people who are really just experiencing their first few days and weeks and months um, in the world, right? Everything 
is experience. Right? It's all experience. And if a, an infant is being loved and cared for, they just know it. Okay? They just know it because they feel it. It's not an intellectual thing. They're not making columns of evidence for and against the empirical claim that my mother loves me. No, if they're being loved, if they're being held secure and kept safe and warm and fed, right, and, and if they're close to the heartbeat and to the breath of their caregivers, they just know that they are loved. Okay? They just experience it. Okay? Christians have, have some of, a little bit of some bad habits when it comes to how we define our own faith. And I, I wish I shouldn't just pin this on Christian because, you know, um, people who are sort of anti-Christian or who don't like Christianity uh, often have the same kind of mental framework um, that I'm about to criticize. I, I'm not really criticizing it, but it's just something that I observe that, that has its limitations, right? It's, it's a cerebral way in which Christians and non-Christians, too, think about our faith, okay? And I certainly am like this, uh, very intellectual. I just used the word cerebral in a sermon, right? right? But you see this, this sort of dynamic when people will get into arguments about religion, right? And you see how important it is to people debating points and counterpoints and are you right or are you wrong in order to explain that why their perspective about God and religion is the correct one. And it is a very, it's an intellectual exercise, right? It, it is a cerebral pursuit. And, you know, people actually believe that your standing with God depends upon which intellectual claims you subscribe to, okay? And, and so much so that if you believe the wrong things about God, people, there are people who will say that you can't expect God to accept you, right? Or to embrace you or to welcome you or to save you if you don't believe the right things, if you don't think the right things, okay? Now, I'm not going to say that having arguments about theology or Christology or ethics or having arguments about the Scripture and what a, a certain kind of Scripture means or how we're supposed to relate to this or that person in the Bible or this or that story and who Jesus really is. If, if we want to have intellectual arguments about these things, I'm not saying that that is a worthless, like a, like a waste of time or something. Um, the truth is that when we read the Bible, we see all kinds of people having arguments about important matters, such as the Apostle Paul. He would get into very heated exchanges with people, and he would be, be quite upset, right, um, over the question of what are the right things that you're supposed to think about God and grace and forgiveness and atonement and where you stand in the scheme of things, right? So intellectual rigor and study and discovery are really important parts of the life of faith. But I would encourage us, like on Mother's Day, for example, <laughs> to recognize that like, what we see in the love that a child is experiencing from their mother, like a baby, right? Like that is not true uh, because we can describe it and explain it. Or it is not less true because the child has absolutely no way of putting into words what is happening as they are being loved. They experience the love. They know the love is true. They know that they are being loved. They know that love is real. And it is true on the basis of that experience. It has nothing to do with whether somebody can successfully win a debate about it. Okay? So I'd like us to keep that in mind 
on uh, Mother's Day. And anytime we read scripture passages like the, the passage that we have read today, um, because the, the passage from John that we just read a moment ago, the passages like this remind me all the time. As much as I like to get into arguments, and as much as if somebody says something stupid, I actually want to take issue with it, and I want to point out how idiotic the thing that they said was, right? I feel that way just like anybody feels that way, right? But passages like this remind me that Christianity is really not about being right about everything and winning arguments and proving unprovable things and not just unprovable things proving things for which proof is not actually the point okay so i i want to contend that more than all that even if arguments are important in many cases more than all that christianity is more about experiencing god and trusting god okay babies with their mothers teach us a lot about experience and trust. And in our scripture reading today, Jesus describes faith like a relationship between sheep and shepherd. Okay, And it, it, it has some parallels to the, the mother-child relationship, though it is a, an, a different relationship, of course, right? But the shepherd does not try to uh, explain anything to the sheep, right? The shepherd does not present a proposal to the sheep as to why they should follow him, right? There is no brochure that details, you know, this is our gold standard of shepherding, right? There's documentation here of recent market performance, letters of reference from other sheep, all together com making a compelling case as to why a formal sheep-shepherd relationship ought to be ratified. Like, no, <laughs> right? It, it, it's not a technical thing, right? It's not an argument by which somebody is convinced. The relationship exists because the shepherd cares for the sheep. The sheep learn the shepherd's ways and the shepherd's voice and the shepherd's scent. The sheep know the shepherd, okay? They trust the shepherd. Now, the way that the scripture describes it, of course, is not exactly, <laughs> you know, it's not a, it's not a normal agricultural domesticated livestock situation. Like uh, Jesus says that the shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep. So obviously this is not someone who simply raises animals for money. The shepherd takes care of the sheep because he loves them. So this is a unique shepherd-sheep relationship amongst all the shepherd relationships in the world. Uh, but why does he love them? That's a question it's fair of us to ask. Um, why does the, she the shepherd love the sheep so much that he would lay his life down for them? Um, because it is not, uh, you know, out because of all the money that the the sheep could possibly bring to him because you would not lay down your life because it's your life just for the sake of um, harvesting wool off of uh, sheep right um, and these are not his children you know so when we're talking about a parent and a child it might be obvious a little bit more obvious why a parent would lay down their life for their own flesh and blood um, but the scripture does say that this shepherd will lay his life down for the sheep, right? It says that this shepherd cares for his sheep. And, and it does give a reason. The reason is very fundamental. <laughs> you know, it's elemental. It couldn't be simpler. It, the, the reason that, that the shepherd will lay his life down for the sheep is simply because they belong to him. That is what it said, says. They belong, the sheep belong to the shepherd. That's it. It's a very elemental thing. And you can try to explain it with fancy words. Um, people have written a lot of books about how God's love works, you know, technically. Uh, but the most erudite 
definition of God's love is not going to help us understand God's love, you know, better than this. Um, we can experience it, okay? Um, we can understand it more as we experience it more, right? But, the, but what is being told in this scripture is that we belong to God. And because we belong to God, God loves us. God loves us. Why? Because we belong to God. That's it, right? If you have to ask what jazz is, <laughs> you'll never know, right? <laughs> so on Mother's Day, you know, we're thinking about mamas and babies and little children and what it means to know the love of a mother, to really know it, you know, to experience it. You know, we remember that the ones who love us shape the way that we want to live, the way that we want to be. I always think of toddlers, you know, walking around the house in their parents' shoes, you know, and it's adorable and hilarious, right? And how a, a little kid wants to put on their mom's glasses and they want to put on their mom's hat, right? We imitate those who love us. Sometimes to a fault, unfortunately, sometimes we replicate the bad stuff, the, the worst <laughs> example, like the bad habits and, uh, you know, bad patterns of people who have loved us. And also, sadly, sometimes we, we didn't get the love that we needed from a parent. And that is an unmet need that manifests itself in all kinds of struggles throughout our lives. But it, it occurs to me that if we want to be good in the world, right, if we want to follow Jesus, be more like Jesus, if we want to shine God's light in the world, um, if we want to make the world a better place for our having lived in it, the first <laughs> and the best thing that we can do to live well is to allow ourselves to really experience the love that God has for us. The love of the Good Shepherd, the love of a mother for her child. It's a love that is true and brave and patient and generous and the more that we experience this love and believe in it and trust in it, the way that a baby trusts as she is held safely, I think the more we will be able to love this way ourselves, guided less and less by fear or resentment or suspicion, and guided more by grace. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>